I am Otto Maduro, president of the AAR for a few more hours. And uh, one of my last performances in the job uh, before leaving it is uh, to introduce and eventually maybe ask a couple of questions at the end to uh, my dear friend and mentor without him knowing it, uh, Harvey Cox. Uh, Harvey asked me, but I already had made a decision in the same direction, not to take too long introducing him. Uh, so that's what I will do, not to take too long introducing him. Uh, I will simply say that Harvey Cox is a world-renowned theologian and one of the figures that has had a most significant impact in the study of religion in recent decades. And most of us know him, and probably all of us who are here know who Harvey Cox is. So without further ado, and with my deepest gratitude for many things throughout the years, and also for accepting this invitation, Harvey Cox. Well, thank you, Otto, for that uh, eloquent and very short introduction. Would that it all could be like that. And I would like to greet especially the novices in our profession who are here today, uh, and to assure you that if you hang around this crazy profession for about 46 years, you too may one day be giving a plenary address at the AAR. It seems all it takes really is a certain amount of longevity, and you eventually get here. Uh, following the uh, input of the panel yesterday on immigration and religion, and also following up uh, where they talked about uh, relig religions under the duress, of, uh, of, under imperial duress, and also Ivan Gabor's holding up of the two words creativity and vulnerability, I want to talk today about what I call the bottoms and the edges. That is the locations in most societies of the vulnerable, the people who live at the periphery. And to ask the question, why is it? And you've noticed this over your years of the study of religion. Why is it that renewal and creativity so often start on the edges and at the bottom? and so rarely start at the middle or on the top. To talk about this, I want to invite you to recall with me a trip I made some years ago, and then to think about why I've been thinking about it all these years, because I think it has something important to say to the questions that we're considering here in Chicago today. It happened while I was visiting the late and wonderful liberationist bishop of, of San Cristobal in, Las, Cha, uh, Las, uh, in Las, Casas. Las Casas, in Chiapas, the most remote and probably the most impoverished section of Mexico, the terrain of the Zapatistas. On one sun-drenched and beautiful afternoon, an aide on the staff of Bishop Ruiz, asked me if I'd like to go out and visit uh, an Indian village, and I quickly agreed. He knew the indigenous languages, he knew the territory, so we drove along this rutted road out to a village a couple hours from, from San Cristobal, and we were greeted there by a dignified elderly Indian gentleman in a serape and sandals, who immediately invited us, as he said, to visit our church and to meet our santos, meet the saints. So we quickly agreed. Well, it was a little dilapidated Catholic church, uh, uh, which the priest only visited, he said, once or twice a year. He didn't seem to be apologizing for that. He was just saying that's what happens in that church. There were no pews, but lining both walls, both whitewashed walls, were rows and rows and rows of Santos. There they were. So we walked around and he uh, introduced us to many of them. And I use the word introduce here because that's exactly what he was doing. 
He was using the formal style of introduction. Now I would like to introduce you, and I would like to introduce you, and I would nod, and I would say, mucho gusto a conocerlo. I thought I should extend my hand, but I, didn't, I knew the statues wouldn't be able to reciprocate at that level. So I simply nodded and, uh, and acknowledged this new acquaintance to whom I was being introduced. Of course, the first one we met was Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, our favorite, he said. Of course, it's everybody's favorite in Mexico, no news. Uh, she, ever since he first appeared to the Indian Juan Diego, that was in 1531 at Tepeyac, just outside Mexico City, and soon became the most popular saint uh, in Mexico, not just in Mexico, but all over Latin America. Uh, and she was, um, uh, she, she was, first of all, viewed with great suspicion and even disdain by the uh, church hierarchy for the first hundred or more years of her existence there. The problem was she was a, a brown Madonna and they had brought along a Madonna, the Conquistadora from Spain, a white uh, Madonna, but people were flocking to the apparition site there in Tepeyac by the thousands and thousands. Uh, and she uh, became very much the favorite uh, of all the Santos. So I, I knew who she was, of course, I had visited her site. However, uh, a few statues down the row, he introduced us to another statue, another santo, and I looked at him with some curiosity. He uh, sported a plumed hat, a flowing cape, high boots, a wide belt with a prominent buckle. His mustache was curled at the ends, a sword and with a graved handle, hung by his side. He looked like a 16th, 17th century Spanish cavalier. Who could he be? Our, our indigenous host said, and now I'd like to introduce you to El Senor de Guadalupe. He is her husband. Well, naturally, I paused just for a moment. Her husband, I said. Uh, but I thought uh, Nuestra Señora was a, a birgen. I thought she was a virgin. Well, he smiled and winked, shook his head, <laughs> and said, maybe that's what they told you over in San Cristobal. <laughs> but here in, in Sintan, here in Sintan, he said, she has a husband. At which the bishop's aide, who was standing next to me, rolled his eyes, but held his tongue. Now my uh, colleague David, David Carrasco, David Carrasco has a word for the process I was witnessing there. The process by which people on the borders, on the bottom and on the edges, appropriate and reconfigure symbols. He calls it transculturation. And on that day in Tsintan, I was watching transculturation in action. Our Lady of Guadalupe has lived through a number of appropriations, transformations, reinterpretations ever since she first appeared. She has attracted uh, lots of people who would like to claim her power, define her identity, reshape her significance, it's been a continuous struggle. She started out by sparking a controversy between a layman and a bishop, between Juan Diego and Bishop Zumaraga, who didn't believe Juan Diego's report until he carried back the famous tilma with the imprint, with the imprint of the Virgin on it. And even after that, the attitude of the official church in Mexico was very, very skeptical, very suspicious. Uh, the Franciscans, in, in particular, didn't really uh, warm up to our, our Lady of Guadalupe. Still, eventually, a church, a modest church, was built in her honor at Tepeyac. She's always had an army of detractors and a cadre of devotees. As a brown-skinned Madonna, she quickly became, as I've said, very, very popular. 
with the uh, Indian population as opposed to the fair complexion diversion the Spaniards had brought along. But there's another reason for the ecclesial displeasure with Our Lady of Guadalupe, and that is that she had appeared thoughtfully at a site, a pre-conquest site, of the Aztec fertility goddess Tonantin. Very thoughtful of the Madonna to appear there. Uh, so the church officials sensed more than just a little whiff of a dreaded syncretism. Their misgivings were not entirely, uh, uh, were not entirely groundless. A priest, a Mexican priest told me just a few years ago that when he organizes the people in his village to make their annual pilgrimage to Tepeyac to visit Our Lady of Guadalupe, they say, si sí, padre, a tonantin, no? He tries to clarify their theological confusion. He says, no, 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 not, not tonantin. The Guadalupe. And they say, si sí, padre, es la misma. It's the same thing, it's the same thing. So here we have a clue, one clue to my question about why so much creativity occurs at the bottom and at the edges. Because here are people who sense that in some way the inherited or imposed governing symbols, at least in their official interpretation, can work against them. So they're, they're uneasy about that. And they're in a better position than some other people, given their, uh, given their location in the society, to, uh, to absorb, to reach out, to reach across borders, to combine, to re recombine. They are, in effect, without knowing the word, skilled practitioners of transculturation. Now, my, me uh, my meeting there in Sintan with uh, El Senor de Guadalupe also prompted me to think about another Mexican saint, Santiago, Mata, uh, Matamoros, the, the Moor Slayer, St. James the Moor Slayer. He was the warrior saint of the Spanish Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula, and later he became the warrior saint of the Spanish conquest of New Spain. He's always pictured on his white stallion wielding his sword and the pictures, the visual depictions of Santiago show his pathway littered with corpses and, and, and limbs cut off. Not a very nice figure. So you would think that as they gradually achieved their own cultural identity and self-definition, the Indian population of Mexico would quickly topple all the statues of Santiago. They would stamp on his images, they would burn the statues. This is exactly what they would do to this wielder of imperial mayhem, right? No, wrong. That's not what they did. Instead, they were so impressed by the power of Santiago that they wanted it for themselves. So they absorbed Santiago. They transformed him. He was, as Carrasco says, he was, quote, harnessed to local purposes as healer and as protector. And he eventually became, next to the Guadalupe, the favorite saint of millions of Latin Americans. Another example of transculturation. So my visit to Tzintan and El Senor de Guadalupe has prompted me to do what we in this profession sometimes call a close reading, like Clifford Geertz did so famously with his cockfight. And it's constantly posed for me a number of questions that I've gone back to time and time again. Some of these are questions that might properly belong in study of religion, some might properly belong in theology, because I've had a finger in both of these fields for so long. I won't try to sort them out. I'll simply let you do that 
Let me start with this question of creativity, which again, Ivan Gabor raised so well. Why does the creativity start so frequently at the bottom and at the edges? Why do subaltern peoples, uh, how do they cope with the symbols that are often controlled by those at the top and at the center? Symbols which frequently work to their disfavor because those at the top and at the center control not only the symbols that inform their own stratum, but often the symbols that inform the entire, the entire culture. So in order to move toward liberation, the people on the edges and on the bottom need to do something in response to these, what I would call symbolic oppression, symbolic oppression. Now let me confess that I do not consider myself to be a mere observer, a neutral observer of this struggle. In keeping with a key phrase in theology of liberation, I believe that our intellectual work as theologians and as scholars of religion should be with a preferential option for the poor. And this means a preferential option for the bottom and for the edges. Where I have come to believe over many decades, we can learn at least as much as we can from any other source about lived religion, how it changes, how it originates, how it copes. So what have I learned from the people with whom I have associated uh, at the bottom and at the edges. Not many of them, by the way, are on the Harvard faculty, but there are a few. First, uh, subaltern peoples as the losers in dominant symbol systems live under constant pressure, either to conform, which is often to perpetuate their own subaltern position, or to challenge one way or another, the dominant symbols. How do they do that? The way they do it, for me, explains some of the amazing creativity of the religions, of the religious uh, groups on the bottom and the edges. Now, there are two things. First, in order to gain their freedom, they must somehow, first of all, distinguish themselves from the dominant culture, culture which, uh, which is engaged in this symbolic oppression. Distinguish. Second, however, they have to imagine an alternative future, different from the one in which they presently find themselves. Distinguish and then imagine. Distinction and imagine. Here I've learned a lot from my former student, uh, Santi Clark, who does such marvelous work on the Dalits, uh, uh, formerly called the untouchables in India. An excellent example of how the consigning of certain people to the bottom and to the edges is anchored in religious symbolism. Here, of course, the classical text is the, is the uh, famous Parusha hymn in the Rig Veda. The vision of human society in which there is a, in which the, there is the head and the chest and the arms and the legs of the mythical Parusha, and it's in Brahmin interpretations at least, the head are the Brahmins, the uh, arms, Shatiras are the warriors, the Vaisyas, the merchants are the stomach, the Shudras are the workers, where are the Dalits? they aren't even in the picture. They are outside the edge and below the bottom. What does one do uh, in the face of this kind of symbolic oppression? How does one respond? Well, there have been various responses among, uh, among Indian people. Gandhi, who is not himself a Dalit, believed that maybe a more equalitarian definition of the Parusha hymn was possible. But his colleague and rival, 
the, uh, an interesting man, B.R. Ambedkar, who was himself a Dalit and was head of their, politi head of their political movement, finally came to the conclusion that this was impossible, that there could be no symbolic liberation for Dalits within the Brahmin system. And so he led many, many thousands, some say hundreds of thousands of Dalits in a conversion to Buddhism. However, this left many, many tens of millions of Dalits still out of the picture. Now there's a new development, however, according to Sati Clark, uh, a movement in which uh, among Christian Dalits, who, by the way, constitute about 80% of the Christian community in India, not to try to convert Dalits, Dalits to Christianity, but to work with them, with their scholars, toward a reform of the entire Hindu religious and cultural system drawing not on outside texts, but on Hindu texts, especially the texts of the revered mystics that contravene this received Brahmin interpretation of the Purusha hymn. According to uh, Santi Clark, the primary task of Dalit theologians in order to enable them to make this historically uh, important move from their humiliation to a new position in the society requires them, first of all, to avoid being domesticated by the existing religious symbolism. They have to create, he says, a counter theology, a counter theology. They have to, quote, he says, harden the edges as their first step to break out of the constant pressure, the attempt of the dominant system to enlist and continue to dominate them. Uh, this was uh, made very clear by Arvin Nirnal, who's quoted by, by Sati Clark when, he, uh, it, when, when the Dali theology movement was beginning. He, he says, there has to be a certain kind of exclusivism because the tendency of all dominant traditions, cultural and theological, is to accommodate, include, assimilate, and finally to conquer. Now this is a very uncomfortable point for most of us in the field of theology or religious studies to try to grasp. Most of us are really uncomfortable with hardening of the edges. We're trying to make them more open, we're trying to make them more porous, most of us. And given the ugly reality of both intra and inter religious bloodletting, why shouldn't we be more interested in softening rather than hardening the edges? So this is a hard thing to grasp. We want to say, ah, he drew a circle that shut me out, but I drew a larger circle that took me in. But is there any place for hardening of the edges? Well, Santi Clark says there is, but one should not stop there. In the construction of a Dalit theology, he sees this boundary hardening as the first step, but only the first step. Then the Dalits take, or should be taking, and are taking the next step, which requires a bold act of imagination. How can we imagine a world without humiliation? Not just when we aren't humiliated, but in which nobody is humiliated. Reaching this stage is fraught, however, with danger. To grasp at it too soon is to risk becoming a powerless satellite still locked within the orbit of the existing elite system. But not to reach for it at all, is to continue to foster, to fester, continue to fester in angry and fruitless isolation. This is what I would call the eschatological moment, the moment of eschatological imagination. I'll come back to that in a moment. But I have to say at this point, this paradigm of, of self-definition, distinguishing, and also of imagination has helped me a lot 
as I try to understand the fastest growing movement in the whole Christian world, namely Pentecostalism, how Pentecostals display both the ability to distinguish themselves and also an uncanny capacity to absorb and, and utilize existing religious symbols and practices in the places where they travel. And they can do it both at the same time frequently. Now, I want to say something about conversion, what I call conversion and the dissimulation theory. There exists a widespread belief that often when people with less power are converted by those with more power, the result can be a kind of pseudo-conversion. Subjected people, it is held, often do not really, not really convert at all. They just seem to. They cope with the conquerors and the missionaries by looking as though they have converted, but, quote, underneath, not really. One might call this the dissimulation theory of religious interaction on the border, on the edge, and at the bottom. The theory holds that crafty natives, while conveying the impression that they have accepted their conqueror's religion, are actually really feigning. They're hiding the idols, idols behind the altars. Cunning to a fault, they are holding their oppressors at bay wisely with a simulated adherence to their religion. But when we recognize the so-called re-harnessing that Carrasco describes in the case of Santiago, re-harnessing rather than discarding, it casts serious doubts on this dissimulation theory. It suggests, at least for me, a much more credible model of what might be happening in the asymmetrical contact between a dominant and a subaltern religious culture. The process is far more intricate, it is more creative, and it is more logical. The Indians reason something like this. If Santiago could infuse that much fuerza into the Spanish, why can't he do the same for us? Why not enlist his power instead of trying to dismantle it? This is, in fact, the logic of transculturation. Now, a word about hermeneutics. Every symbol, as we know, invites multiple and often contending interpretations and applications. And hermeneutics is the study of how this happens, why certain interpretations win out, others lose, some prevail, others disappear. When I met El Senor de Guadalupe in Sintan, I saw the process of symbol formation taking place right there before my eyes. Symbol formation and symbol transformation. But when the bishop's aide rolled his eyes, I was also reminded that the process is often conflictual. When the bottom and the edges com com uh, uh, collide with the center and the top, a war breaks out, a hermeneutical war, if you will. Much is at stake. Transculturation is always contentious. And Our Lady of Guadalupe is not only a tilma, she's also a battle site. People fight over her, how to control her, how to interpret her. The image I have in my mind is of that famous tilma with her image on it and two parties, or at least two, pulling at both sides to see who can control what is obviously something endowed with enormous religious and symbolic power. Hermeneutics is not just the study of interpretation, it also invites a question, involves the question of who controls the interpretation. And therefore, it is about the blunt deployment of political and cultural power. Something that I've learned a lot 
from my colleague Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza about. Thus, the question of who Our Lady of Guadalupe really is can be a misleading one. The question is, who controls who she is? It's a matter of her public placement in the culture, her location. In the case, in the case of the Guadalupe, all kinds of people recognize her power. They're all pulling at that tilma. They want to draw on it. They want to deploy it. They want to use it. And the battle, believe me, is not yet over. The Guadalupe has many detractors, long list of suitors as well, to enlist her spiritual power. There are modern historians who insist that Juan Diego never existed. He was a mere myth. But on the other hand, there is the enormous devotion that the Guadalupe inspires among so many millions of people. And there is also all those tourist dollars that flow in as people visit her shrine, her basilica, and her other shrines. So much so that in, 19, in the 1970s, the Mexican church collected millions of pesos to construct a shiny new basilica, and then they moved the miraculous image into it. And they positioned the tilma, the miraculous image, behind a phalanx of the thrones for each of the Mexican bishops. And then the placement says it all. The brown Madonna whose life began in a dispute with a bishop is now made the celestial benefactor of a whole hierarchy of bishops. There you have it. Ah, but it isn't over. When the uh, Basilica was consecrated in 1976, the privileged and the powerful of Mexico City crowded inside. They'd already bought grave spaces there. They wanted to be near the image when they were buried. They were all in there. And the descendants of the poor Juan Diego, who trekked by the thousands to venerate her, couldn't get in. They couldn't afford the ticket. And so they stood outside praying in the rain. And when they visit today, they are whisked by the tilma, whisked by the image on a kind of a Disneyland style moving sidewalk with hardly a moment to pray. So the quarrel goes on. Uh, a Mexican liberationist priest with whom I visited the shiny new basilica a few, a few years ago as we surveyed the whole scene, looked at the tilna, looked at, all, at the gold thrones of all the bishops, and he leaned over to me and said, Harvey, she's been kidnapped. <laughs> but had she been kidnapped? Well, I think not. Meanwhile, in California, Cesar Chavez, with his embattled farm workers, moving from Delano to Sacramento, carrying the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And as we heard from Jacqueline, uh, from Jacqueline, uh, what's her name, uh, Hagen? Jacqueline Hagen yesterday on the panel here who studies, uh, who studies immigration, she is still helping thousands and thousands and thousands of undocumented workers, inspiring them and comforting them as they move into El Norte. The quarrel still goes on. And even John Paul II enlisted in the battle. In 1999, he named Our Lady of Guadalupe patroness of all the Americas and protectress of the unborn, one of his favorite causes. And he also named Juan Diego, a, he beatified Juan Diego, whether or not he's a myth. So the question is still unanswered. Will anybody ever achieve final control of this powerful, powerful lady? Rumors persist in muddy, muddy Mexican villages that the, uh, she really doesn't like her new basilica, her new palace, and that one day she will return again somewhere else and have a different message. I call this poor people's eschatology. <laughs> 
So let's talk for a moment about uh, eschatology. Uh, any, anyone trained in the history of religions knows if you visit Tzintan and meet El Senor de Guadalupe, you are witnessing the result of what is called a hieros gamos, a sacred marriage. In this case, a sacred marriage between power and compassion, one of the oldest forms of sacred marriage. Now, of course, the people in Tzintan never heard about hieros gamos but they were exhibiting a religious imagination which has been with human beings for a very long time. The swashbuckling cavalier with his sword and his cape, symbol of colonial power and later of elite power, the Guadalupe, the incarnation of compassion and love, are wed, a brilliant exercise in religious imagination. This is not a statement about history, of course. It's certainly not a statement about Orthodox Mariology. I cannot imagine that Pope John Paul II would have approved of this marriage. This is, so to speak, a marriage made in heaven. The lion lies down with the lamb. Now consider again the Dalits, having achieved a sufficient degree of their own identity, their own history, then the next move is to eschatology. A dangerous move, a dangerous move. But it's a move that any religious movement eventually has to hazard. And anyone knows the ragged and jagged history of the concept of the kingdom of God in biblical religions realizes that. If you uh, say the kingdom of God is already present, realize eschatology, then the bite is lost. There isn't that transcendent pivot in order to criticize and change existing institutions. But if you locate the kingdom of God too far away as an ideal, as a dream, as a, merely a utopia, uh, then it becomes almost equally irrelevant. It has to be attention. Still, it is an act of imagination. In creating their eschatologies, different people draw on different sources. Often, subaltern peoples reach back into the mythical stories and the lore, the narratives that the conquerors have tried to suppress and build out of these fragments an eschatological vision, which always reminds me of the old Appalachian hymn, a land where no cabins fall. A land where no cabins fall. The early, early Christian history, of course, is absolutely jammed with reworked Jewish apocalyptic stories, symbolism, metaphor. It goes on all the time. But uh, a second way in which vulnerable peoples fashion an eschatology is to reconfigure dominant, the dominant religious system. And here's what I'm talking about here today, I suppose. Sometimes they try to discard it the way some of the Dalits did, the, the Parusha, often, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. More often, they try to transform it. And anyone familiar with the songs of the civil rights movement in America knows they were retranscriptions, often of hymns, hymns which had earlier referred to something very transcendent, but now referred to something that you could reach out for now, freedom now. This is eschatology. It's the branch of theology in which imagination takes command. Just like the joining of the dashing cavalier and the compassionate brown virgin in Tzintan. And projecting that, that vision of the future in, in order to look at your situation today. And this brings us finally to what I call uh, uh, 
epist call, uh, um, the epistemology of the, of the edge and the bottom. Epistemology simply means thinking about how we know what we know, how we know what we know. And as I've pondered my visit to Tzintan and my, visit, my meeting with El Senor de Guadalupe, I was watching there a particular kind of, of epistemology, an eschatological epistemology, to put together two words that we don't normally link together. In most Western epistemologies, however important the imagination may be, it could be important in very many ways, it should not influence the way we see what is really here and now. That is a, an intrusion of the of, uh, imagination into an unwarranted place. However, when we're dealing with the bottom and the edges, we encounter a different kind of epistemology, a different epistemology in which how we see the present is informed by our image of the future and often radically transformed in that way. This is something that the German philosopher Ernst Bloch uh, developed so brilliantly in his The Principle of Hope. He called it anticipatory illumination. Anticipatory illumination. Seeing the present in the light of a hoped for future and therefore transforming the present. To me, it's uh, significant that so many of the spiritual pioneers and religious revolutionaries of our own time have changed their point of view about reality and what was possible in reality when their, the position from which they were looking at reality was changed, often not by their choice. Gandhi spent time in jail, and so many of the others had their position, their perspective changed when they were put behind bars. Vakla Havel, in his wonderful book called To the Castle and Back, his part of his life story, Vakla Havel talks about how his time in prison as an alleged subversive in Czechoslovakia was the best preparation for him when he became president of Czechoslovakia. He saw things differently. Martin Luther King was imprisoned 11 times. Malcolm X's whole worldview changed when he was sitting behind bars in Boston. But perhaps the most memorable lines about the value of the prison experience in changing one's perception of reality were written by still my favorite theologian, namely Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Sitting in the Tegel Army Prison in 1943, soon to be executed for joining in the plot to assassinate Hitler, he writes to his friend Eberhard Petke. And here are his words. There remains for me and for all of us an incomparable value. We have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the outcast, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed, the reviled. In short, from the perspective of those who suffer. I'm almost at the end here. And this conclusion is a little existential. A little personal. Where are the bottoms and the edges today? In our own lives, in our own work as scholars. David Carrasco again reminds us that we find the cultural borders now, not just at the geographical edges, we find them everywhere. Every city in America and many elsewhere are now borderlands. We all live on the borderland. My own city, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the high school, has children from families that speak 24 different languages. Television, internet, immigration, 
has thrown us all together in a way that our fathers, grandfathers, and grandmothers could not have imagined. We all straddle the borders every day, even though we are often not conscious, conscious of it. And I think what uh, that movement to the edge or to the bottom has done for so many of the people who have influenced me and my own theology so much, think about the privileged young Walter Rauschenbusch, who changed completely when he began a his pastorate in the Hell's Kitchen section of New York City and went on to found the social gospel. Think about a young pastor in Detroit named Reinhold Niebuhr who found himself in the crossfire of the labor management battles. None of us lives very far from the bottom or the edges. Then I read, just before I came here, the wonderful book of uh, Daniel Boyarin called Borderlines. It's about, principally about the partitioning, what he calls the partitioning of, of Judeo-Christianity. And he points out, or reminds us, that all borders, whether between nations, between cultures, between faith traditions, all borders, do not spring up on their own. Someone draws those borderlines. Someone draws them. And someone draws them for a particular set of reasons, and some people resist them. So the question is, who's drawing them and why? Who's resisting them and why? They are not dictated by heaven. They occur within history. Boyarin goes on to question the borders we've inherited in, in Christian history between orthodoxy and heresy, as others have done as well, and even the border between early Christianity and Judaism. But there's one sentence early in Boyarin's book that caught my eye more than any other. In explaining his own reasons for being drawn into his radical border questioning, Boyarin says that as a youth, he was a, quote, oddly gendered teenager, an oddly gendered teenager. This passing reference suggests to me that we all need to acknowledge the arbitrary borders, like gender lines, that the culture has, has inscribed within us, not just around us, but within us. It also suggests to me, however, that it may be in part because Boyarin was able to recognize the fluidity of the borders within himself, that he could see more clearly the instability of those in the outside world. So at least some of my questions about why creativity emerges among the vulnerable have been answered. I have many more questions. Someday I would like to return along that rutted road to Tsintan in Chiapas. I'd like to visit, once again, El Senor de Guadalupe. This time, however, this time, I would pause before his statue. I would light a candle. And I would say a brief prayer of thanksgiving, because he has taught me a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harvey, for a very thoughtful and very uh, teaching talk. We still have about 10 minutes for the two promised questions. Uh, the theme of this year's AAR is migrants' religions under imperial duress, as you know. And uh, we can immediately see the connections between your presentation and the theme of the AAR. My question would be a 
very specific one regarding the present moment in the history of the United States. We live in a paradoxical moment in which, for example, the overwhelming majority of new businesses created in the state of New York are businesses created by immigrants. And simultaneously, we live in a moment in which we are seeing for the first time in many decades a massive effort at deporting immigrants, probably 1,400,000 uh, people have been deported in the last four years. How do you see this uh, paradox in relation to the future of the United States as a Christian committed to the people in the bottom and the borders? Well, I think that uh, moment that we're living in is a passing moment. Maybe that's my existential, eschatological, utopian view. I don't think it will last. I think that the uh, uh, emphasis on, I think it's called self-deportation, as well as other kinds of deportation, is not going to work. It's a passing, uh, it's a it's a passing moment, all, however, a painful passing moment for many of those who are caught in that net. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. And I think it will become evident to lots and lots of people that, uh, as you mentioned, the new businesses, the energy brought into our society by, by immigrants, which has always been the case, will eventually evidence itself in such a way that we simply can't uh, go on with that kind of anti-immigrant uh, ugliness. However, I acknowledge it's there. And I think we have a, we have a fight on our hands to, uh, uh, to appreciate it and to do something about it. I think we, we started doing something about it in the last couple of weeks. And let's hope that that uh, continues. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, I think the anti-immigrant uh, anti forces are fated to fade. Thank you very much. My second question is related to the Occupy movement. How do you see the Occupy movement as part of the uh, changes and initiatives uh, from the bottom and the edges in a certain measure that announce the possibility of a better future for all? Well, like many in this room, I'm sure I was uh, thrilled and cheered by the Occupy movement. I went down and spent a couple days uh, on Wall Street. I'd never been to Wall Street before, before they occupied it. Uh, it's not a very inviting place, by the way. Uh, then we had an Occupy movement in Boston, which was thriving for a while. And I spent a lot of time with them. We even conducted an ecumenical service every day at the Occupy movement. Uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, my, my comment is this. There, is, there was, and I think, think still is, enormous energy and dedication and a kind of a, kind of a utopian vision uh, among the, especially the young people in the, in the uh, Occupy movement. The, the step they need to take, I think, and I may be too far outside that generation to advise them of doing this, is, to, is, is some discipline in, in organizing and targeting what the next move should be. Uh, under the auspices of the Episcopal Cathedral in Boston, uh, uh, I had the privilege of bringing in Jim Lawson from California, who had been Martin Luther King's chief uh, uh, organizer of nonviolence, trainer and organizer for nonviolence, and we held some meetings in Boston with the Occupy people where Jim shared his experience, his vast experience, in the civil rights movement uh, with them and gave them some friendly advice on what they should do next. And it was a little like this. Look, you can, you can stand there or sleep there or eat there for a very long time. People will just ignore you. There you are. Uh, after a while, even the disruption doesn't count much. What we need to do next, he said, is to target particular places in Washington, in New York, in the city of Boston, and as we did in the civil rights movement, make it very difficult for those institutions to continue because of uh, our willingness to 
be arrested, to lie down in front of doors, to disrupt things. The, the Occupy movement was not sufficiently disruptive. And in order to be disruptive, you really have to internalize, I think, that nonviolent uh, ethic that Jim Lawson so, so wonderfully epitomizes, having studied Gandhian movements in India and then worked with, with, with King with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So I'm hoping that's what they'll do, but frankly, they're not asking me for much advice. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to proffer it if anybody uh, asks, but uh, I, I hope they move in that direction, Otto. Thank you very much, Harvey, and I will ask for another round of applause for our speaker.